Verily, man is in loss. Everyone, they're all in loss except those who believe and they do good deeds and they advise with uh, truth and they advise with patience. A lot of people come and they bring a doubt. And I hear it a lot, so I think we should talk about it and we can come to a good conclusion by the end of this. Some people bring this doubt, they say, what about the good deeds of those people who do charity, but they are disbelievers, or uh, they do good in this life, but they don't believe in Allah. Maybe they are atheists. Wouldn't it be unjust of Allah not to reward them? They come and say, Allah is just, they did good for people, Allah should reward them. And what if He does reward them in spite of them being a disbeliever? then what difference does it make if we accept Islam or not, if Allah rewards everyone who does good? If even the disbelievers get rewards, why should I accept Islam? All I have to do is do good. Can't we just be good people without accepting any type of religion? Maybe we just nice people, treat everyone good, maybe this is good enough, they say. Are all those outside of the religion of Islam doomed to go to Hellfire. Even though they contributed and helped poor people, they helped medical uh, sciences, they helped build schools and churches and uh, other things that helped community. Is belief a necessary condition for our deeds to be accepted or not? How can a disbeliever who saved millions of Muslims, for example, by his medical uh, science that he found, he found a cure for something, and he's a disbeliever, and that cure saved millions of Muslims. How can he go to hellfire, whereas the Muslim who sat on his couch and didn't do anything, all he did was his wajibat, he goes to Jannah. How come? A lot of doubts. This comes a lot of time. Maybe we have ourselves have thought about these things, but I, I hear these a lot, especially from the youth. I was reading a book uh, and it was giving a story that at one point in Mashhad there was some people who had leprosy, like contagious disease that spread very deadly. No one wants to go around that, those people. They would exile them or put them somewhere else far away. So no one wanted to deal with these lepers. Then all of a sudden this group of Christian ladies, these nuns, they came from France and they went and helped these patients. And they would go there, and they would—they have tasbih too. They would do their uh, rosary, and they would pray, and they would help these Muslim patients. So, the doubt came in the mind of the one who saw this: How come, you know, these righteous women—they guard themselves, they are remembering God, they're not Muslim. You know, how can they just go to hell because they don't believe in Islam? But they're helping all these Muslim people, and they're helping people in general. How come Allah would send this lady to hell? So we have to take a look at this topic from a lot of different angles and uh, inshallah we'll come to good conclusion. Firstly, we see Allah repeated that verse in the, in the Quran many times. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمَلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Except those who believe and they do good deeds. These two are always linked together when we look at them. <coughs> So we have to put forward the question that uh, is the only religion of Allah accepted is Islam or not? Does Allah accept uh, the religion that belonged to other prophets? Someone follow religion of Prophet Musa, Prophet Isa, they are Jew, they are Christian, they are Muslim. Or is only one religion accepted in each era, each timeline, each time frame? So some groups, they come and they put the idea for, they call it religious pluralism, that all those religions, they are all working toward the same thing, they're trying to please Allah, they're all on the same path, different ways to get to the same destination.
So they say, as long as I believe in Allah and I strive to be a good person, it doesn't matter who I should follow. I can follow Musa, I can follow Isa, I can follow uh, Muhammad. It doesn't really matter which one I follow. They were all sent by God and we're all on the same path to go, same destination. You take this religion, I take this religion, we do good, we'll end up in the same place. This is what they bring. Someone may be confused by that and say, I don't know, maybe that is correct, maybe it's not. It sounds nice to people and they say we're all on the same way. But we have to really look at it and see, is this truth or not? If this were the case, that all the religions were okay, and that we're, they're all on different path to the same place, and that Allah will accept all of these people who follow these religions, then why did the Qur'an call the Jews and the Christians to come towards Islam? If they were all good, why, what would be the purpose of sending the Prophet to guide them, if they were already on a path that leads to somewhere good? This is the first thing. We have many uh, verses in the Quran that show that the, they must accept the last messenger and that the only religion of, of Allah that is accepted in that time is the religion of Islam. So it would be pointless for Allah to call those people back to his, towards Islam if they were already good, if they were straight on their way and Allah accepted them on that way, why would he call them back towards Islam? So there's not multiple true religions in each time. There is only one religion in each era. And we have to submit to that religion and follow that and follow the prophet of that time. We see the Quran, it says, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ no religion other than Islam will be accepted from anyone. Whoever follows religion other than Islam, they will be losing in the hereafter. So if someone comes and they say, by Islam, it means submission to Allah, submission to God. But in reality, the submission to Allah has its form in each era. Each time it has a form. And for example, in the time of Musa, it was to follow Musa. In the time of Isa, Prophet Jesus, it was to follow him. And now after Prophet Muhammad it's time to follow him. <laughs> Allah tells the Prophet, says, tell them if you love Allah, follow me. Allah will love you and forgive your sins. Allah is all forgiven, all merciful. Tell them, obey Allah and the Messenger. If they turn away, let it be known that Allah does not love the unbelievers. So we see from this verse that if we truly love Allah and we want Allah to love us and forgive our sins, then we must have taslim. We must submit to the Prophet, obey him and follow him, not follow anyone else from before. So we have the question now, what if a person doesn't accept the chosen religion of that time that they are living in? They don't accept Islam, for example, but they do a good deed that's accepted by the religion. For example, they build a school. School is good, it's accepted by Islam, that's a good deed, but they are not Muslim. What happens? They don't accept the religion of their time. Do they receive reward for this action or not? For example, non-Muslim builds this school, hospital, orphanage, or they make scientific discovery that helps mankind. They help the poor, they help the elderly, they help the disabled. The one who brings this question says, Allah is just, Allah is adil. He will not ignore the good deeds of this individual. That would be wrong in their eyes. They said, this would be wrong to ignore this. So we have to go back and see, okay, what does Allah say about this topic? He says, وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةِ وَلَا يُذْلَمُونَ نَقِيرًا Whoever does good deeds, whether they are man or they are woman, while being a believer, Allah puts this condition, while being a believer, those will enter paradise and they will be not be wrong.
wrong. So we see that good actions here are linked. When Allah says that you do good actions, it's linked. In Arabic, wow uh, halia, this wild means wild. And it says wahu uh, al mu'min while they are believers. So we see that the condition for the deeds to get accepted is that they have to believe. So we see that necessary condition of this. If belief didn't have an effect on the good deeds being accepted, then why do we need to accept the religion at all? If belief had no bearing, it only mattered if you did good deeds or bad deeds and religion didn't have any effect. Why would we need religion at all? We could just be good people and just do good deeds and stay away from bad deeds. Why would Allah have called us to follow religion? Why would Allah have called us to follow a messenger? Why would he have sent us a messenger if religion didn't have anything to do with it? Now we look at the deeds of believers. We have to see what Allah says about deeds of disbelievers. It says, as for those who do not believe in the hereafter, we have made their deeds look beautiful. So they are wandering astray. So we see that the disbelievers, they may seem that they're doing good actions, and they may think that they are doing good actions, and they appear like this, but in reality, they don't hold the spiritual value. They're devoid of the intention. They don't have Nia of pleasing the Creator. They're only one-dimensional act. This is why I want to talk about because deeds have different dimension. One dimension is, uh, is this that they just do the good for others, but this is a like worldly intention. And we also have another intention, another dimension, which is spiritual. The Quran says, the deeds of those who deny the existence of their Lord are like ashes blown about by a strong wind on a stormy day. They will achieve nothing from their deeds. What they have done is in error. The deeds of disbelievers are like a mirage, which a thirsty man thinks is water until he goes near and finds nothing. Instead, he finds Allah who gives him his recompense. Allah's reckoning is swift. So it shows like that in outwardly, they may look good. The deeds look good. They look acceptable. They look nice. But in reality, they are like a mirage. And in hereafter, they will not find anything from those. So it shows, the Quran shows us that belief is a prerequisite, something that you need in order for the deeds to be accepted in the next life. So when we speak about disbelief, there's different levels of disbelief and accountability. One comes from juhur. This means when Islam is presented to them, they reject it. They know it. They accept it. They recognize the Prophet. They recognize what Islam is, but they say, I will reject it and they are stubborn, and they are arrogant. And they reject it because they want to. <clears throat> this is one. Instead of asking Allah to open their hearts to accept the truth, they would rather be destroyed by the truth. Allah says, they also say, Lord, if this Quran is the truth from you, then shower stones down on us, on us from the sky instead of rain and send us a painful punishment. This, we have this in story in uh, Ghadakum, when the Prophet said, Man kuntu mawla, fahada Ali and mawla. Whoever I am his master, is Ali is his master. One of the guys said, Rasulullah, did this come from you or did this come from Allah? Because it's his cousin. And he said, Maybe you do something now, the Balah, like uh, uh, elect your family member. And he didn't want Imam Ali to get it. Rasulullah told him that it was from Allah, it's not from me. And he said, this is from Allah. I would ask Allah to send a stone down on me. Now, instead of accepting the truth and accepting walayat of Amir al-Mu'maneen, he said, I don't want to accept this. I would rather be killed by the stone. The stone came down from the heaven and hit him in the head, came out the other side of him, and he died. This is tafsir from these uh, ayat. So we see that some people are stubborn. Even they know it's the truth. Prophet told him, this is from Allah. He said, I would just rather die than deal with this. And some people are like this. They accept this. They know Islam is the truth, but they don't want it. They are stubbornly in disbelief. This is one type of person. Second type of person, they're truly ignorant of truth. They don't know about Islam. But maybe if they heard it, they would accept it. 
but we don't know because they never they never took the time to learn it and they never were presented with it or maybe they reject the Islam that they portray on the media right we also reject this type of Islam we see this Islam from for example from uh, Daesh or Taliban or this type of uh, t terrorist people we reject this sort of Islam too if someone presented that to us, we would say, that is not Islam. We don't accept that. So maybe that's all they saw, and they just said, I don't like Islam. I don't accept Islam. They don't know anything else. But if the true Islam of our Lubayt were given to them, maybe they would accept it. So this is the second type of uh, disbeliever. So some people, they say, they say that the uh, good and the bad deeds... Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi So some people they come and they say these good deeds and our bad deeds they are good by their essence or they are bad by their essence they are either totally good or they are totally bad but they are missing a point in this that when we do deeds it has to have niyat it has to have intention the belief that an action will only have like a good effect on society isn't enough. An action has to do be done with sincerity. We have to have ikhlas. We have to have sincerity behind the action. The, we see that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he said the value of deeds, your deeds are valued by your intentions. We talked the other night about intention. Allah says, He created death and life to put you to the test and to see which of you is the most virtuous in your deeds. Notice that Allah in this ayah, He says that He will test us to see which one of us is Ahsanu Amala, the best in the deeds. Not the most in the deeds, but the best in deeds. It doesn't matter about the quantity, how many good deeds we do, it matters about the intention of our good deeds. What did we do the deed for? Who did we do the action for? For example, someone established a school, we mentioned. This, this will be seen as a good deed. In society, everyone say, you know, that's very nice, this person built a school or a hospital. And they will remember that person in history that such and such built this hospital. And they will always remember him as a good man or a good lady, whoever built the school. This one dimension of the action, worldly, people will remember them. But the other action is spiritual. If the person established that school or hospital to show off and they were seeking fame, it's only dunya, only for people to remember them and say, so and so built this school or this hospital, but they didn't do it for Allah. They will only have the reward here. It's one-sided, one dimension, only for this world. They are lacking the other part because they didn't have the niya in order to please Allah. So we can say from this that uh, this one-sided dimension only for this world to be remembered is only like a historical remembrance, only historical goodness. But if they have belief in Allah and had good intention, then they will also have a spiritual dimension of this deed. When those two come together, the deed will ascend towards the heavens and will count as a good deed for the people. If not, if they don't have intention, it will stay here and only be remembered in this life as something good. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We can also see this in our uh, laws in America. We can see that we have different dimensions. For example, when it comes to the taxes, the tax collector, the IRS, is not caring what your belief is, what your spirituality is. They just want to come and collect your taxes. But when we have to pay our homes or zakat or these type of things, we cannot just give it. We have to have intention. I have to have this qurbatan illallah, or to fulfill my duty, or to please Allah. You have to have the spiritual intention also with the giving uh, the intention in this dunya for it to be accepted. Our sixth imam, he says, perform your actions for the sake of Allah and not for the sake of people. 
because whatever is good for whatever is for Allah ascends towards Allah, and whatever is so is for the people does not go towards Allah. So Imam is showing us there's dimensions to our deeds. For us to have them accepted, we have to have the intention to please Allah. So we see that the reckoning of Allah is the value of the action lies in the quality of our action, not how many actions we do. What good if a person does 100 rakats, for example, and they are thinking of all sort of things. They are not thinking about their salat. Their mind is wandering here and there, but they do 100 rakat. Versus the person who does two rakat, but he is uh, mukhlis, he is sincere. His intention is for Allah. He is focused in his prayer. These two rakat are much more than the person who is doing 100 rakat. So many, we see that many factors come into play when it deals with our, with our deeds. Intention, sincerity, law, uh, halal money, for example. We don't have this thing like in uh, the stories of uh, Robin Hood where you steal from the poor and you give to the, you steal from the rich and give to the poor. The ends don't justify the means in Islam. You cannot hurt someone else to achieve some other good. So sometimes think these things, they may seem like they're good actions on the surface from people who don't believe in Islam, but that's because we don't see what was done in the process. The angels see our deeds, they record our deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the, uh, where our money came from, what our intention was when we spend in charity, what our real intention was when we built this Islamic center, for example. And we mentioned before, I'll, I'll say again, in case someone wasn't here, there's the story of Bahlu. When this person built a masjid, he wrote his name on the masjid. Masjid al, uh, you know, um, let me say Masjid al Mustafa, for example. The guy's name was Mustafa who gave all the money. Just for example. So Bahlu came at night time and he put a big X through his name and he wrote Bahlu over the top. So the people got mad the next day, said, Bahlo, how come you wrote your name on the masjid? You didn't give any money to that masjid. You want everyone to think you did it. He said, who did you build that masjid for? They said, we built it for Allah. He said, are you sure? You were concerned about whose name on it, but Allah knows who donated for that masjid. So we see that intention of that person who built it was to show off. It wasn't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, whoever desires the enjoyment of this life will receive it if we want it to be so. Then we will make the hellfire his reward wherein he will suffer, despised and driven away from our mercy. But whoever desires the hereafter and exerts the effort due to it, and he is a believer, is those whose effort is appreciated. And amongst those people, they say, Our Lord, give us good in this world. And in the hereafter, He will have no share. He's only thinking of doing good deeds, and He only wants good in this dunya. Allah won't give Him the spiritual side of it, which was the hereafter. <clears throat> we see the next verse, we always say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fil akharati hasana, wa qina adab al nar. We ask Allah for good in this dunya, and good in the hereafter. So we see that Allah's mercy, His Rahmaniyyah, is given to all the creation. Meaning we all have the opportunity, we all have the conditions to go seek good deeds. It's, us to up, it's up to us to seek His pleasure or not. Or it's up to us to seek the dunya with our actions. If the person's intention is to seek recognition in this world, so people know him as someone famous who gave a lot of stuff and he was generous and this type of thing, uh, then that's what they will get. They will get historical goodness and people will remember them in this dunya as someone who was nice and gave away a lot of their money. But the person who seeks Allah's pleasure with these deeds, their deeds will have the other side that counts for us, the spiritual dimension. And these deeds are the ones that will go towards the heavens. And we should use this dunya, this world, as a place where we plant the seeds. And we see the fruit of those actions in the next life. Sometimes we don't want to plant the seed because we won't see the benefit of it. Maybe we won't see what will grow from that thing. 
but we have to have faith that we will see it in the hereafter. We don't need to see the uh, fruits of this thing in this dunya, actually. Maybe we say that, uh, you know, I am uh, old and I pay the money for something, but I, I want to build a hospital, but I'm sick. And maybe I won't see the completion and I won't see how it goes, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't pay because I won't benefit or I won't see it. But you're giving it for the next generations and the next generations in Sada Kojaria. As long as that is operating, masjid, hospital, school, all these type of things, then you will receive those rewards in the hereafter, even after your death. So back to one of those questions is about the, now we've talked about types of disbelievers, we've talked types of good deeds, do we have certain religion or we can follow all religions. We know that there's one religion from every era of time and from our time, from the Prophet until the end of time, the religion is Islam. So the question comes about those people who don't believe in Islam. They have done humanitarian work like these nurses we mentioned who helped those lepers and mashrafs. They didn't have any selfish motive at all. They only wanted, they didn't care about seeking fame in the world. They didn't care about being famous. They just helped to help, but they did not believe in Islam. And they were disbelievers. We have some narrations that some disbelievers like this, they will have their punishment reduced. Hatam al Ta'i is one of the famous ones during time of the Prophet, was very generous and used to give his wealth and help people. So we have some of our big ulama from the past. Alama Majlisi, for example, author of Bahar al Anwar. He quotes from Shaykh al Saduq the, from his book, Thawab al Amal. Very good book. It tells all the rewards of uh, actions and also the punishments of actions. So he narrates from Ali ibn Yaqteen, strong narrator, one of the companions of Imam Qadam alayhi salam. He says, Imam says, amongst Bani Israel, children of Israel, there was a believer whose neighbor was a disbeliever. The disbeliever would always be nice to the believer and give good akhlaq and nice and uh, imagine you have a non-Muslim neighbor and every time you go out to your car, he's like, good morning, how are you, uh, nice to see you, and, and bringing you gifts and helping you with things, and he's always nice to you, but he doesn't believe. He said, when this disbeliever died, Allah made him a house out of mud, which shielded him from the hellfire, and his sustenance would be given him given to him from outside of hellfire. Allah would send him food from uh, Jannah, for example. And he, he was told that this was because of your kindness and your good conduct towards your believing neighbor. So due to this disbeliever, he, did, he didn't believe in Allah. So he's not going to go to Jannah like the believer would. But also he may not be punished in the hellfire. Maybe he is living there, but he is Allah is covering him from that punishment, but he is residing there. Alama Majlisi, after this narration, he says, the tradition and others like it are evidence that the punishment of some disbelievers in the hellfire may be lifted. The verses of the Quran that say the punishment of the disbelievers will not be lightened. We have some verses in Quran say their punishment will not be lightened even a little bit. So how can we reconcile these with sayings of Imam? Alamah Majlisi said that those are for those who have not done such good deeds. Those disbelievers who didn't do good towards other people, they will not have their punishment lightened at all. But those who have done good deeds, we see these type of narrations. <laughs> what about those who believe in Allah, but they, this is for disbelievers. So what about those people who believe in Allah, but they follow other uh, religions? They rejected the Prophet, but they follow Jesus, or they follow Musa, we see that the faith in Allah and the Prophet is a criteria, it's uh, essential to follow the Prophet of your time, the, pro the religion of your era, for your deed to get accepted. So doing good while believing in Allah is not enough. You cannot do good and believe in Allah, but we reject the, the Prophet. 
we have to accept the prophet of our era. We have to accept the religion of our era. Our belief system is a complete system. We have to observe wajibat, we have to stay away from muharamat, do the things we are supposed to do, stay away from the things we are commanded not to do. And we see that Christians and Jews, for example, they do good deeds, yet they partake in forbidden things by the religion of our era. For example, drinking alcohol, amongst other things. They do not fulfill wajibat that are on all of mankind. These things are not just for the Muslims. Allah has made this for mankind. We have salat, we have fasting, we have uh, khums, hajj, zakat, all of these things. So even if they do these good deeds and they don't have any hatred in their heart, but they still reject, like willfully reject the guidance of Allah and do not follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, then we see what will happen for their deeds. It's not enough for them to be accepted in this way. It's like they're planting seeds, but they're not following the proper method of farming, for example. They are putting the seeds, but they don't know what they're going to get. They don't get the proper fruit. That they don't reap the benefit of the farming because they don't have the proper guidance to do the farming. They rejected the guidance to do the farming. We need to follow the advice of the, the one who teaches how to farm. In the same way, we need to follow the advice of the one who teaches us how to live. And the one who teaches us how to live, the true life is the Prophet. So if we do our deeds without following the Prophet or without believing in the Prophet, it's like the farmer who is farming without any guidance. Allah says, then it, is to, then it is one to whom the evil of his deeds has been made attractive. So he considers it good. For indeed Allah sends astray whoever he wills, and he guides whoever he wills. Don't let yourself perish over them in regret. Indeed Allah is knowing of what they do. Another example is a person who is sick. He takes the medicine without the guidance of the doctor. Maybe he gets better, maybe he doesn't, maybe he takes too much, maybe it kills him. Maybe he doesn't take enough, he doesn't take it for long enough, it doesn't have any effect. He is taking medicine without the guidance of the doctor. Whereas the Muslim is taking the medicine with the guidance from the doctor. The spiritual doctor, we can say. The one who came as a mercy for us, a mercy for mankind. Rasulullah. If we want our disease to go away when we take the medicine, we have to follow the prescription of the doctor. He says take it for 10 days and this many times a day and you will be healed. If you take it 5 days and once a day, then you are still uh, not going to be healed. You don't take the you have uh, infection, you need to take antibiotic. If you don't take, you start feeling a little better after three days and you say, I'm not gonna take the medicine anymore, the, the, the sickness comes back because we didn't follow the prescription exactly as the doctor gave it. We also have many spiritual diseases that we have and we want to be healed from those. But we need, we try to do it a lot of times without following the guidance of the spiritual doctor we can say that was sent to us of prophet so we need to in order for our deeds to get accepted and for in order for us to be successful in this world and the next life we need to follow the guidance that Allah has given us Allah sent us a prophet Allah sent us a religion and in order for us as we see many times for our deeds to get accepted Allah says and he is a believer so we see in this world we have these two dimensions. To take away from this talk, we have a worldly dimension for those people who do good inventions, they do good deeds, they build charitable things, but they don't believe in Allah at all. Or either they follow a different religion, they believe in Allah but they reject the Prophet. They do things for historical goodness. They just want to be remembered in this world. This is one side of the, the dimension of the action. The other dimension of the action is niya, qurbatan illallah. How can we expect to do, get rewarded by Allah if we don't believe in Allah? 
we're doing an action, we want to have a spiritual reward, but we don't believe in the one that's giving the reward. So we have to have belief in the one that's giving the reward. And when we believe him, we have to follow what he has commanded us to do. And he says, Follow the obey the prophet. Obey Allah, obey the Prophet and those charged in authority amongst you. So we want to have our deed accepted and get the spiritual side. We need to believe in him and follow the religion of the one who he has sent. So to end this, to conclude, to summarize, four groups of people. Those who believe in Islam and they do good deeds, inshallah, they have good intention, they are sincere, they will have their deeds rewarded. Second group, those who are non-believers and they reject Allah and they reject His Prophet and they did deeds purely just for worldly gain, for money or for recognition or for fame or something like this to show off, they will not benefit from their deeds on Day of Judgment, but maybe they will be remembered remembered in this world as this is what they wanted. They wanted to be remembered in the books of history as someone who did good, someone who did charity. And that's what they will have. But in the hereafter, they won't have anything because they didn't have the spiritual aspect of the deed. For it, the Imam says you need these two for it to ascend. It only just stayed here on the, on the earth. The third are those non-believers, but they did their actions not for showing off, not for fame. They, they had a good intention. They only wanted to help other people for humanitarian reasons. They had pure intentions and they helped believers. They may have their deeds, uh, you know, become a reason for their punishment to be lightened in the hereafter. Maybe they are not going to Jannah, but we have Rawaya that they could be in hellfire, but not being punished. They are just there and they are getting their sustenance from outside. They don't uh, have the reward of a believer. A believer did all the things Allah told him to do and not to do, and, uh, and followed Allah's guidance, so they shouldn't have the same um, uh, level as believer. This is one of the reasons why. And the last group of people that we mentioned are those who are truly weak. Mustad'af, mustad'afin, those ones who are weak. They didn't know about Islam, and they couldn't find out about it due to their limited ability. Maybe they were somewhere uh, before that they had no access to Islam, and they didn't know any Muslims, and they died on that way, and they only knew way of uh, the previous religion. It's very hard to find Mustad'af in this day because we have internet and Google, and many things are just at our fingertips. But if we imagine some years ago that uh, you know, someone is living in one of those islands and they didn't have internet or Google and they only knew their religion, you know. And Allah will take them on day of judgment and uh, because they didn't believe and they didn't disbelieve. They weren't presented the Islam or they weren't presented it in the right way either. And they had no way to find out. This type of people, Allah will judge with them how he sees fit. Allah will test them in the hereafter and present it to them to see if they accept it or they don't accept it. So this concludes this talk and inshallah by the end of this we have a better idea that our deeds need, that it's not just as simple as we just do a good deed here and it gets accepted or not. It has to have different components to our deeds. And we covered the many different types of people and their deeds and what happens with their deeds. Sajjala ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma kulli waliyaka al-hujjat ibn al-hasan salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai fi hadhi al-sa'a wa fi kulli sa'a waliyan wa hafadha wa qa'idan wa nasara wa dalilan wa ayna hatta tuskanahu ardaka taw'a وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين الله صل على محمد